So good morning. I'm Amy McAuliffe, the current chair of the National Intelligence Council, or NIC, and I was asked to speak today about strategic warning. I want to thank Steve Slick and the leadership at the University of Texas at Austin for hosting us all today. So the remarks I'm about to make are mine and mine alone. They do not represent uh, the views of the NIC or the US government. I think rather you'll see that they represent kind of a hard knocks career that I myself have had. So I've entitled the talk, Strategic Warning in the Real World. Policymakers expect both strategic and tactical warning from the intelligence community. In theory, strategic warning has a longer term horizon, is more general, and of course, focuses on issues of import to US strategy and policy. Tackle, tactical warning is supposed to warn policymakers about a specific incident. But in real life, these lines blur and publishing these warnings are not enough. I would argue that policymakers need to know that these warnings are markedly different than the daily crises with which they are bombarded. They need to realize and acknowledge that they are being warned. And I believe that it is at least in part the intelligence community's job to ensure this acknowledgement from policymakers. So what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes addressing these issues through the prism of IC analysis, analysis about the misaptly named Arab Spring, focusing on the period from 2005 to 2014. In the five years leading up to the Arab Spring, the IC provided strategic warning about trends in the Arab world that would threaten these brittle regimes' holds on power. We failed, though, to believe our own analysis and understand that we were essentially issuing warnings about the staying power of these key allies of the United States in the Middle East. Some of this analysis we called alternative analysis. Um, I've built much of my career on what we call analytic tradecraft, the way we do our work, the way we do our argumentation. And I would tell you that while alternative analysis is important, and it's an important tool, what we did in that lead up period is we published these pieces once or perhaps a few times and then stuck them on the shelf, forgetting about what we had said. Some examples, from 2005 to 2010, we warned about demographic and economic trends and the public's concerns about succession in places like Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. In the same time period, we did a whole host of these alternative analysis pieces to which I just referred. Some of them answered questions such as, what if there's a coup in Egypt? What if the Shia majority topples the Sunni monarchy in Bahrain? What would a post qaddafi Libya look like? But the problem is, we did not weave any of this daily, any of this analysis into our daily tactical or even longer term strategic analysis in a systematic way. We published it, as I said, and then it sat on the shelf. So in some sense, I believe that we were not taking our own warnings seriously. Beyond the strategic warning that I just discussed, we failed to warn tactically that the protests in Tunisia were potentially regime threatening. I don't think anyone could have known that a Tunisian fruit vendor was going to set himself on fire at that moment, and we could not have known that Ben Ali's regime would abandon him and he would flee. But what we should have done is really sat back and taken a look and said, you know what? What we're seeing is unprecedented, not just in Tunisia, but in the larger Arab world. And we should not have assumed, as we did under my leadership, that the military and security services would remain loyal to him. Despite the popular lore, though, we adjusted quickly and recognized that dissatisfaction in Tunisia and the successful unseating of an Arab ruler would threaten other regimes in the Middle East. We explored all of the fault lines that we had warned about for years. Some examples. We wrote a piece in the middle of the Egyptian revolution in which we warned that this unrest was likely to spread, and we highlighted Egypt, Bahrain, and Libya as especially at risk. In the case of Egypt, 
we effectively used scenarios and warned halfway through the revolution that a takeover by the Muslim Brotherhood was a real possibility. In Libya, we warned early that the regime was quite brittle and that the Libyan military was about to crack. In Syria, using some of our most unpopular analysis with the administration, we warned repeatedly that Bashar was likely to hang on to power and that a sectarian civil war with many negative implications for Syria and the larger Middle East were coming. So from the perspective of an intelligence professional and for the students here, what did we do that was effective in this period of time? I would tell you that we effectively used scenarios so that allowed us to avoid point predictions, right? When we were looking, for instance, at Egypt in that real period of uncertainty during the revolution, Mubarak didn't know if he was going to be in power the next day. The street didn't know who was going to be in power. And different elements of the military probably didn't know if they were going to side with the regime or not. The use of scenarios allowed us to consider a range of possibilities. And I think we did this effectively, not just on Egypt, but on Syria and on Libya. We also used a rather simple technique of what I'll call indicators or signposts. So we thought long and hard about what regime threatening unrest would look like in various different countries, Libya, Bahrain, whatever. And we really paid attention if we saw some of these indicators blinking. And I think we did good work as a result on Libya, Yemen, and Bahrain. So what do I think are the lessons learned of, of all of what I've just said? I think number one is that it's really hard to understand and I think be ready for radical change unless you've lived through it. So I had analysts working for me who had just witnessed the events in Egypt who in no uncertain terms, I think their going in mindset was, well, this can't happen here. And so what I effectively, I think did, and I did many things ineffectively in my career, was kind of establish a culture throughout the office of we have to learn from each other. And of course, while each country is different and has a unique culture, there was something larger going on here. And I think we all really needed to work together and learn from each other. So that's number one. Number two, warning analysis must be integrated into the larger analytic line. So we can't just write it and kind of place it on the shelf, warn once about, I think, big change coming. I think we have to be creative and find ways to link it kind of to the more tactical analysis that we do for a variety of administrations. What I've done in the NIC to implement this is in our seminal product, National Intelligence Estimates. They don't go out without a, at least a text box, if not a key judgment on how we could be wrong. And when we write these sections, we do not fight ourselves, and we, it's not fake analysis. It literally is if you overturn one assumption or another, or something that you're not expecting changes, how does that radically change the judgments that we've made going forward? Another lesson learned, and people laugh sometimes when I say this because I think it seems simplistic. Maybe Nick or somebody will question me on this. I think that warning analysis should be labeled as such. And this, to me, is, if you're a policymaker, every day is full of very negative developments and ever-changing worlds. And I think inherent in everything the intelligence community produces is some type of warning. What we've done on the NIC now is there's essentially a red banner that we place carefully only on a select few products where we say special warning analysis. Now, hard decision to make. You can't be chicken little. Not everything is a strategic warning, but we very carefully select the topics where we apply this banner. And I can't tell you all of them, but the one that, that pops into my head, I think most readily, is um, probably starting about two years ago, we did a number of pieces on the prospects for a much larger military conflict in the Middle East, perhaps starting between Israel and Iranian forces in Syria, or starting between Israel and Hezbollah. And that would be the type of issue where we'd place this red strategic warning banner. Next lesson. I think that you have to 
balance what I would call good analytic tradecraft, or for the audience here, I'd call it the way you argue your case, right, with an ability to really consider the strategic possibilities. And I think a real turning point for the US intelligence community, and I lived through it, was Iraq WMD. And I can tell you, as someone who worked for seven years in the, the technical office, who made uh, you know, at least a portion of this call at CIA right after Iraq WMD, we take very seriously in the intelligence community when we get something wrong. Um, we learned a lot of very important lessons from Iraq WMD, but I think we overlearned some of them. And I think, on balance, a number of the analysts in the intelligence community, I think, are now gun shy, and they're overly cautious. So I think we have to find a way to make it clear what our judgments are, of course, not oversell the judgments, use confidence levels, address our gaps, but at the same time, be willing to say something of import that will help our policymakers. And then I think, finally, and I believe Bob and others will echo me in this point, I think we have to be humble, have humility, and know our limits. Um, none of us are Nostradamus. I think it's really hard to predict the future, given the very complicated global environment in which the United States operates, and given that in many cases, we're thinking about the behavior of authoritarian regimes, right? Our adversaries who may not show their hand even to their closest advisors in their regimes. So I think we need to consider the strategic possibilities and warn, but I think be aware of the limits of our own capabilities. So those are the remarks I wanted to make a bit as a scene setter. I welcome uh, the presentations from the other panelists, and I very much look forward to the question and answer portion because that's always my favorite part of one of these discussions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ambassador Hutchins. Thanks, Steve. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, Steve has already introduced Amy, and you've just heard from her. He's introduced me as well. Let me introduce our other two panelists. Uh, first, Dennis Wilder, to my immediate right, who is a former special assistant to the president and senior director for East Asian Affairs at the NSC, and currently a professor of the practice at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Uh, he had a career in the, in the Central Intelligence Agency during the Obama administration, was senior reviewer of the President's Daily Intelligence Briefing. From 1995 until 2005, he was chief of the China Analytic Studies and the Director of Intelligence. Um, to his, the far end of the panel, my friend Philip Bobbitt is no stranger here at UT, a longtime UT law professor. Uh, he is now the Herbert Wexler Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the Center for National Security at Columbia Law School, but retains a position here with us as Distinguished Senior Lecturer at the UT Law School. Uh, he's a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a former trustee of Princeton University. He has published 10 books and is a well-known commentator on national security affairs. So um, what I thought I would do is Try to sell a few books. No, that's not. I, this this uh, volume is just about to come out. It will be published in June by Oxford University Press, just in time for beach reading. Um, but I thought it was a, it was a good. This is the, the first and only history of the National Intelligence Council, which actually is a history of the strategic intelligence function in the U.S. government. So I thought that book and what we discovered along the way would be a nice way of framing the, uh, the rest of the, of the conversation because many of the key issues that were with us today were with us at the very beginning. So I will try to outline some of those. Um, a word about the book. Um, the, the reason this came, the way this came about was in the fall of 2016, then chairman uh, of the National Intelligence Council, Greg Treverton, Amy's predecessor, had the good idea of convening a meeting with all the former chairs and vice chairs going back as far as, as he could find them. Um, well, on the flight from Austin to, um, to Washington, I happened to share a flight with my LBJ school colleague, Alan Cooperman, who when he heard about this conference said, you ought to write a book about the NIC. Well, I thought, 
I really, I'm not really an intelligence guy. This wouldn't be a very good idea. But he planted an idea. We got to the conference. All the last eight chairs were all there. We get along well. We didn't overlap. We have no issues between us. We like each other. They're interesting and varied people. So I thought, I don't want to write this book. But I could see a book that comes from the experiences of these eight you know, important and interesting people going back to Joe Nye in 1993 and all the way up to Greg Treverton in 2017. He left right at the beginning of the Trump administration or the end of the Obama administration. So I first persuaded Greg to be a co-editor of this volume. And then we prevailed on the other six former chairs. And somewhat to our surprise, but to our delight, all agreed to write chapters. So that's what the book is. It's uh, eight chapters written by these former chairmen. Um, and I'll just tell you who they were. Joe Nye, Richard Cooper, John Gannon, John Helgerson, me, Tom Finger, Chris Kojum, and Greg Treverton. It's an interesting mix. A couple are career intelligence officials. A couple are lifelong academics who got pulled into government from time to time. Most of us had careers that overlapped in the policy community, in academia, and in intelligence. So we all came at our positions from, with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different biases, no doubt. But we all sat in the same chair, as it were. So that makes the, uh, the, the link. Along the way, I concluded that we really needed to tell, to, for this to be a, a fully rounded history, we needed to go back to the predecessor organizations of the National Intelligence Council. So I agreed to write an introduction, which turned out to be really a fascinating uh, experience. So let me give you a little bit of that early history and then jump, leap forward to the, to the present. So the origins of the strategic intelligence function go back to a directive issued by President Harry Truman on July 8, 1946 instructing the Director of Central Intelligence to, quote, accomplish the evaluation and dissemination of strategic intelligence, end quote. In sending that directive, he deliberately did not send it to the Secretary of State or the leaders of the armed services. He sent it to the intelligence community, the newly formed intelligence community, setting up a quite deliberate tension between intelligence and policy. This tension um, usually cooperative and collegial, sometimes conflictual, has sort of been part of the defining element of the relationship ever since. Hence the title of the book, Telling Truth to Power. Um, so this is one of the light motifs of truth to power going through the entire history of the NIC and its predecessor organizations. The actual story goes back even a bit earlier to December 7th, 1941 and the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. So this is what caused President Roosevelt, who had already appointed his friend William J. Wild Bill Donovan, head of something called the uh, Count Committee of Information to coordinate information, caused Roosevelt to appoint him director of the new Office of Strate Strategic Services with the idea that um, we needed a coordinated intelligence capacity to prevent another strategic surprise uh, like Pearl Harbor. So this is leitmotif number two, intelligence failure or strategic surprise. I should say intelligence failure, either real or alleged. It's a recurrent theme that hangs over the heads of the N National Intelligence Council and the intelligence community generally. FDR never gave a Wild Bill Donovan the full authority that he wanted FDR sided instead, and appropriately so in my view, with the military chiefs who did not want in the intelligence function coordinated by some central authority outside their control. They wanted line authority over their own intelligence capacity, as I think is inevitably the case and properly the case. This creates another, another tension between the need to coordinate intelligence but the need of military commanders to have unity of command and line authority over uh, intelligence. Um, a, a related issue here is the, uh, uh, this leads to another theme that we developed, and that is the ambivalent commitment of senior political leadership to the idea of strategic intelligence analysis. Yes, of course, everyone 
wants it in principle, but in practice they often pull back from giving uh, uh, an intelligence uh, organization semi-independent authority because they don't like intelligence to be, in effect, judging their performance and policy. So this ambivalence has been with us ever since. Um, so after the war, um, Harry Truman basically repeated the judgment that FDR made. He did create a central intelligence agency with a director of central intelligence, but it was a weak DCI model. That is, the DCI, the director of central intelligence, ran CIA, also was charged with coordinating the work of the intelligence community generally. So it had general coordinating authority, but not much real authority uh, for the exact same reasons that caused FDR to make the choice he did about the Office of Strategic Services. Um, so the new director of Central Intelligence, actually there's another little wrinkle here. Um, CIA didn't have much authority in the early days. It took another intelligence failure that is the North Korean invasion of the South to cause Truman to have a shakeup at the CIA and appoint Eisenhower's chief of staff during the war, General Beetle, Beetle Smith, to be the new director of Central Intelligence with a stronger mandate to shake things up. Smith then uh, created the Office and Board of National Estimates, creating the art form of the National Intelligence Estimate, which continues to this day. The Board of National Estimates was headed initially by William Langer, the laud lauded history professor and future winner of the Bancroft Prize from Harvard uh, as its director. He was succeeded for, by Sherman Kent, his deputy. Kent served for 15 years in that capacity. Kent was of the view that to, to be independent and to render independent objective analysis, the intelligence community and the Board of National Estimates needed to be distant from policymakers. Um, this leads to the, uh, yet another light motif, the tension between the need to be close to policymakers to know what's going on in their minds, but distant enough to not be sucked into their world entirely and lose objectivity. Kent took this mandate of truth to power to the extreme and was at the Board of National Estimates produced some good work under his tenure. He assembled a board of, of uh, luminaries, academic and other luminaries, but was increasingly accused of being uh, of Olympian detachment. That is, his work was way out there in the leafy Virginia suburbs in Langley, kept an arm's length from policymakers, and produced judgments that were ex cathedra. This is our view. You should take it or perhaps leave it, but this is our view. So um, this then caused a backlash and ultimately the the abolition of the Board of National Estimates and its replacement in the 1970s by the National Intelligence Council. So let me take these five light motifs and just touch on some ways they have recurred in the, in the time since. They appear in almost every chapter. I won't go through this in, in great detail. I will just tease out a few important ones. So um, truth to power and the related problem of politicization. Uh, this certainly ar arose in my tenure when I took over in 2003, a month before the Iraq war. During the early phases of that war, we did some good and well-received tactical intelligence work. We had three video teleconferences a day for the early part of the war, providing tactical information to, to war fighters. Questions like, will if the Iraqi regime uses chemical weapons, which we believe they would, when would that occur? What, what, point, what point in the conflict? Another one, um, if we go into Baghdad, will the bridges be blown? And when we expect that, those kinds of things, very well received. However, once the, the successful invasion gave way to a highly unsuccessful occupation, the message we were sending downtown was uh, not welcome. The message in various forms that we were sending was the anti-American insurgency is growing, intensifying, and broadening, and it's not because of foreign fighters, it's not because of some exogenous events, it's because of the occupation itself. 
This was not what, what political leaders wanted to hear. Um, so I went into that uh, job thinking I would develop close and cordial relations with my policy counterparts because I knew almost all of them. Condi Rice and I had been next door neighbors at the NSC in the uh, early 1990s. Um, I'd worked with many of the others in various capacities. Um, but this created a real, a real tension. Um, but I felt that our obligation was to tell truth to power no matter what. Uh, that was what we were charged with doing. Um, we finally, pro we'd produced several lower level um, uh, assessments. We finally, in the summer of 2004, produced a full-blown national intelligence estimate, which held out three scenarios, sort of uh, a holding operation at the most hopeful to full-scale civil war at the negative end. Um, it leaked, not by us, but it leaked to the New York Times. And once it leaked, of course, it became the talking, the, the issue that everyone was talking about. So uh, President w Bush, George W. Bush, dismissed it as guesswork. His press spokesman accused us of hand-wringing and naysaying. An editorial in the Wall Street Journal uh, warned the director of Central Intelligence that he had two insurgencies to worry about. One was going on in Iraq, the other was going on in his own building. So this is, these are some of the costs of telling truth to power. Um, a second theme, uh, which also uh, affected my tenure and those of those who followed me, intelligence failure. And of course, I, the first was the uh, intelligence failure or alleged intelligence failure of 9-11, and the second was the WMD estimate to which Amy has already uh, referred. In my view, um, it's been by no means clear that 9-11 constituted a massive intelligence failure. If by that is meant that attack should have been prevented with reasonably good intelligence performance, it's worth noting that the 9-11 the Commission, which was highly critical, stopped short of rendering that severe a judgment. The WND estimate was, was different. Amy's referred to it. Uh, I think that was a, uh, a failure. Uh, the failure was principally one, in my view, of confirmation bias. Everybody knew, in quotes, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, not nuclear, but chemical and biological, because they'd already used chemical weapons on 10 documented occasions. There were unaccounted for stockpiles from the last time UN inspectors were in the country. Therefore, by simple matter of arithmetic, those unaccounted for stockpiles must still be there. So armed with this preconceived judgment, the intelligence community uh, went about assembling evidence to help demonstrate that conclusion. Um, it's, it's a long story. I won't go into too much detail. There, there are other, uh, other issues at play here, and one of them being the speed with which this estimate was put together on congressional mandate. Members of Congress were looking for a, a, someone else to hold accountable for a decision to go to war, so the estimate was put together in three weeks, and it came out in a, in a flawed flawed way. Um, so a third issue, and this also occurred in my um, watch, was the uh, ambivalent commitment of senior leaders to, to intelligence. I've already talked about the high, high degree of unreceptivity to intelligence judgments we were rendering. It came up to in the um, Intelligence Reform and Terrorist Prevention Act, the major, the first major reform of intelligence for decades that occurred in 2004, 2005. It was the combination of these two intelligence failures that created a political climate conducive to this massive uh, reorganization of, of intelligence. Interestingly, um, the model it was decided upon reflected some of the same trade-offs that FDR and Harry Truman had made back in the day. One of the, one of the issues was the insistence on military commanders and their Republican friends on the Hill that the unity of command not be interrupted by some new intelligence czar who would disrupt the unity of command. So that, was, that led to giving the new director of national intelligence a very large mandate, but insufficient real authority to, um, to fulfill that mandate. 
that was at least the, the take I had at the time. I leave it to, to those who've served since me to, to sort of make a judgment about how well that's evolved uh, in the period since. Um, a fourth um, theme that I mentioned, and that is the question of distance versus proximity. Distance from policymakers versus proximity to policymakers, known inside uh, the intelligence community as the Kent model, distant, and the Bob Gates model, proximity. Gates, who was a political player, believed intelligence ought to be very close to policy to know what's on policymakers' minds. Um, it's always a struggle for, for chair, chairs of the NIC to find the right balance. Of the chapters in our book, I think Joe Nye probably did the best in striking this balance. He had very strong personal connections with key leaders of the, on the policy side, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, and, and so on. He was all around town. He was able to be both a player and a kind of an independent voice it was respected, so the, the Nick's work was respected, and I think that was a, a model many of us have, have tried and failed to emulate. I mentioned earlier that I thought I might be able to play such a role, but I was disabused of that uh, hope very early on. This issue came up in a very, in a geographic sense in the tenure of John Gannon, when there was active discussion about moving the National Intelligence Council downtown to F Street, a block or two away from the White House. Uh, and Gannon was eager to do that. This would give him proximity. He was pulled back by several national intelligence officers who, who felt this would disrupt their ties with the intelligence community analysts, uh, especially the, those doing military things that relied on lots of interaction with the Defense, Defense Intelligence Agency and CIA. Um, so ultimately, it was, it was pulled back. and. Um, it's still an interesting question whether that would have been an improvement in the Nick's work or, or not. Um, and the final light, light motif that it sort of hinted on, it's sort of related to that one, that is the long-term and strategic perspective of intelligence versus the short-term and tactical. All of us, I think, who sat in that chair tried to do both. If you're not relevant to the issues that policymakers are wrestling with right now, you might as well hang up your, your hat and, and not bother. Yet, if you're only playing in the realm of tactical intelligence, you're not fulfilling the, the idea that Harry Truman had way back earlier, and that is somebody somewhere needs to be thinking and looking over the horizon, even mindful of all the limitations of prediction. Um, so in his chapter, uh, Greg Treverton, who served right up till January 2017, worried uh, that although the NIC in his tenure had become much more relevant because the, the, the NIC was preparing the Director of National Intelligence for all his meetings at the NSC principals and, and deputies level, so they were in the mix of all, these, all the decision making, he worried that this had come at, the, at some expense of the provision of strategic over the horizon intelligence. And his view was that if the National Intelligence Council doesn't do it, no one's going to do it because the rest of government has become so operational. I know others in the panel will have thoughts on that score, so I will simply leave it there and turn it over to Dennis Wilder. And I will say I'll, I'll call on Dennis and then Philip. Then I will call on Amy to see if she wants to make any remarks based on what she's heard, give the other panels, panelists a chance to do the same, but save time for your own questions and comments, which we would very much like to, to hear. Dennis. Good morning. Uh, let me start with the uh, usual disclaimer that all of us do. The views I express today are my own. They aren't the views of the United States government. Actually, they aren't even the views of Georgetown University. Um, I want to say a word, though, about our sponsors, Steve and Admiral Inman and this conference. I don't think you know what a great job uh, they are doing and what a service they are doing in setting up this center here at the University of Texas. 
Um, I come from one of those inside the Beltway institutions. We need institutions dealing with the questions of intelligence and the intelligence community that have some distance from the Washington establishment because I think it is very easy for us within the swamp uh, to become terribly uh, self-important uh, and self-centered. And so I think the fact that you are assembling here at the University of Texas a first-rate team of academics and pr practitioners and you're adding to the team, as Steve has noted today, with excellent people who I worked with in government, I think you should be very proud of what you're doing here. And I know nowhere else actually in the country where an, a, an effort like this is underway. So congratulations. I have strong views on the subject of strategic surprise because I spent a career at the CIA trying to make sure that I was not surprised on China and more importantly that directors of central intelligence were not surprised. While flank, frankly I am grateful that I no longer wake up every morning terrified that I've missed the key signal on China, as an academic I do worry about this issue a lot. If, as National Security Advisor John Bolton said recently, how we approach China is the most consequential existential security question of 21st century, then we ought to make sure that we are positioned to avoid strategic surprise or at a minimum to be highly resilient strategically by having the best expertise, sources, and insight that we can possibly have. I agree with John Bolton that getting China right in U.S. foreign policy and intelligence is one of the critical questions we face. But I am a little bit concerned that the steps we are taking very appropriately to raise CIA awareness on China are having some unintended consequences that I want to talk to you about today. And ironically, I think our CIA community may be playing into the hands of the Chinese Communist Party by depriving us of some critical human expertise and invaluable intelligence. So what am I talking about? At Georgetown this year, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the School of Foreign Service. And so, of course, we're looking at our own history. I want to introduce you to one man today, a decorated American hero who you've probably never heard of, whose work should have helped us avoid strategic surprise on China, and whose analysis of China could arguably have helped save millions of lives in East Asia. His name, John P. Ludden, graduated from School of Foreign Service in 1930, joined the Foreign Service in 1931, John was a tall Irish-American from Falls River, Massachusetts. From 1932 to the beginning of World War II, he served in various diplomatic posts in China, learning the, his trade, learning the language, building incredible China expertise. In August of 1944, John was seconded to, from state to the military to join what was called the Dixie Mission, whose Mission was ordered by the famous General Joe Stilwell to spend time with the communist guerrillas led by Mao Zedong in Yunnan. John's personal task was to travel deep behind enemy lines into Japanese occupied territory in China and evaluate whether the United States could organize intelligence networks using communist manpower and facilities to fight the Japanese when the U.S. troops eventually landed in China to prosecute that part of the war against the Japanese homeland. Remember that this time the U.S. had just taken back Guam and President Roosevelt had approved MacArthur's plan to invade the Philippines. John, who one of his colleagues remembered as a big, blunt, red-faced Irishman, was very skeptical of the communists but he traveled 900 dangerous miles in the dead of winter with them into Japanese territory, coming close to Beijing, and his conclusion was, and this is a direct quote, 
that they were the most realistic, well-knit, tough-minded group in China. John's first-hand report never got to the President of the United States, to the Vice President of the United States, or to General Douglas MacArthur. Why? Because when he arrived in the nationalist capital of Chongqing in January of 1945, Stilwell had been replaced, and Patrick Hurley, the new ambassador, thought the communists were worthless. And he criticized him for even going behind the enemy lines. By the way, this man's knowledge of China was so thin that he routinely called General Chiang Kai-shek Mr. Shek. Hurley refused to listen to Ludden's report and instead upbraided Ludden for consorting with the communists. Ludden was sent back to Washington and spent the rest of his obscure state career wondering what would have happened if somebody had taken him seriously. Well, what didn't happen because no one took him seriously? Let's take a look at it. First, Roosevelt and Truman wasted billions of taxpayer dollars supporting the lost cause of Chiang Kai-shek, most of whose army defected to the communists during World War of the post-Civil War very, very quickly. Had senior policymakers heard and understood Ludden's assessment of Mao, maybe they would have been forced to rethink the support for Chiang Kai-shek, maybe back a more competent nationalist general. We don't know. Similarly, General Douglas MacArthur. General Douglas MacArthur had a very low regard for Chinese communist troops and the Red Army. And had he had a higher regard, maybe he would have been more judicious in his actions. You have an, uh, a historian here at the University of Texas named H.W. Brand. If you want to look at MacArthur's mistakes, I highly recommend his book, The General Versus the President, MacArthur and Truman at the Brink of Nuclear War. In that book, he recounts the meeting between Truman and MacArthur in, on Wake Island on 15 October 1950. MacArthur at that meeting assured Truman that there was very little chance of Chinese intervention. He said there were only 300,000 Chinese troops in the provinces near Korea. We now know there were 900,000. He said at best the Chinese could get 50 to 60,000 troops across the border because of logistic problems. In actual fact, within three days of the Wake Island meeting, the Chinese poured 260,000 troops across that border. Now, I'm afraid to say, sorry to say, CIA has to share part of this blame. If you look at the 6 November 1950 national estimate, we placed the Chinese troop strength in North Korea at that time as only 30,000 troops, and we certainly did not have a high regard for communist forces. So why am I boring you with ancient history? Because I'm worried that we may repeat some of these same mistakes. Let's look at a few things that we are doing today that are, I think are dangerous. First of all, we have an excellent program which we created in 1994 called the Boren Fellowship Program. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a program where we send American students overseas, many for language training, and then insist, of course, that they come into the federal government to do some time to pay us back for that training. In 2018 and 2019, fully 20% 20 of those students are studying Mandarin Chinese. But let me tell you what the difficulty is. When they return to the United States, they are routinely denied top secret clearances. Why? Because they've been in China, because they've been exposed, because we had one case of a student in Shanghai, which is on the FBI website, who was approached by the MSS. And we have allowed ourselves to be terrified of this situation 
It's called Game of Pawns. You can see it. It's a great little film about a young man named Glenn Duffy Shriver. But instead of equipping our students to go to China and act in a responsible manner, all we're doing is saying to them, go, have a good time, and when you come back, sorry about it. You can't get a clearance. Secondly, we have a policy now in the US government where if you have a Chinese national spouse, even though that person has become an American citizen, you may not serve in China. No American officer with a Chinese American spouse can serve there. So our experts, our people that are not only culturally tied, but physically tied to the culture, can't go. Does that make any sense to you? Thirdly, first generation US citizens. It's quite apparent to me from the students I talk to that first generation Chinese and other Asians have little or no chance of being hired in the intelligence community today. And then many of our best and brightest Asian American analysts have left the intelligence community because of concerns over how they are perceived. I cannot help but think the fact that some of the finest, most successful intelligence professionals that I ever dealt with at the CIA were first generation Chinese who came to us after World War II. Their stories are not well known, but for those of you who can read classified, I wrote an homage to them before I left the agency in Studies in Intelligence that is available to you. And all I can tell you about that, because it's classified, is these were brave, highly patriotic Americans who served this country with the highest distinction. Now, I don't want anybody walking out of here thinking that I'm saying the Chinese threat isn't real. But I am asking you, are we denying ourselves a new generation of outstanding China experts because the Chinese have thrown fear and doubt into us about the clearance process? Have the Chinese psyched us out by approaching a few US students in China? And if so, why are we spending taxpayer dollars sending people on boring scholarships? At the end of the day, we must ask ourselves what is the right balance between protecting ourselves from moles within the intelligence community and losing critical expertise. Now, I will tell you, when I was chief of analysis at the CIA, I routinely brought these cases to Director Tennant. And Director Tennant would go to security and he'd say, give me an answer. Why is this person on permanent hold? Which, by the way, is one of the tricks that security uses. They just put you on a permanent hold rather than ever telling you that you've been denied a clearance. I'm not asking them to cut corners, but I am saying they are worth the additional effort that often security doesn't want to make to clear them. So let's return to strategic surprise for just a moment. What would I say are the three biggest potential consequential strategic surprises for the United States in East Asia in these first decades of the 21st century. First of all, a North Korean implosion, I think, would have to rate right up there. Our collected wisdom is that sanctions won't bring Kim Jong-un's government to its knees. But what if we're wrong? Will China simply sit by and watch the demise of its buffer state without taking action? Will they allow South Koreans and American forces to enter the North to stabilize this situation? Or will they invade? Will we find US and Chinese forces once again facing each other in the Korean battlefield as we both struggle to contain loose nukes in that country? Second, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Again, our collected wisdom is that Beijing has too much to lose economically and geopolitically to risk this. But the balance of power on the Taiwan Strait has shifted dramatically in Beijing's favor after years of Chinese military modernization as evidenced by RAND Corporation's excellent report, China Scorecard. 
Does Beijing still believe we're willing to take the risk of a Sino-US confrontation over Taiwan? And how long is President Xi going to tolerate the defiance of China by the independence forces on Taiwan? Third, a collapse of the PRC itself. China now represents 20% of the global economy. A collapse of China into internal chaos, like the Cultural Revolution, would create a global economic tsunami of a sort unseen in modern history. Are we sure China's stable? Why did the Chinese president in a speech in January warn his party faithful of gray rhinos and black swans? So as I end, I want to make something very clear. I have never and do not take the threat posed by China lightly. I'm proud to be part and have been part of an approach to East Asia that's kept the peace ever since World War II through military strength, robust alliances, and advocacy of democratic ideals. I'm proud we continue to defend the Taiwan people against Chinese coercion and that we speak out loudly against outrageous human rights abuses by the Chinese government in Tibet and Xinjiang. However, I believe if we overreact to the yellow peril, we will actually give China what it wants. A United States divided against itself, denying itself the strength and vitality of first generation immigrants and victimizing our own citizens. So, my message to you is incredibly simple. We need to aggressively recruit more Raymond P. Luddens with deep in-country expertise in government service, even if they are tougher to clear than someone perhaps from Salt Lake City. But we also need first-generation Americans with last names like Guo, Yang, Nguyen, Lee, who may not have been born and raised in Falls River, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Steve Slick and the Intelligence Studies uh, Project. I want to uh, just share a few thoughts that have troubled me about strategic planning, particularly with respect to the methods of scenario planning, and also the deep problem of what is sometimes called Parmenides fallacy. For nearly 50 years, American decision makers have relied on various forms of strategic planning, a method that begins with a desired result and plots the steps uh, that have to be taken to reach that goal. This general method worked well in a stable uh, environment of superpower competition. We were relatively wise and uh, in some ways uh, lucky to extrapolate from a familiar security environment. But uh, in the increasingly decentralized world in which uh, previously insignificant actors and factors can play a decisive role, Strategic planning can often leave decision makers wrong footed. In its unidimensional reliance on a single desired future, strategic planning can harden into an official future. As the Nick put it, while straight line projections are useful in establishing a baseline and positing a mainline scenario, they typically present a one dimensional view of how the future might unfold. In this new era of uncertainty, it is said, and, and I've said this, that we must approach the future with an acceptance that simple forecasting is not going to be very useful to us for a while, that no one has a clear view of what is coming. Instead, we must sharpen our skills of forethought so that we have some idea of the multiple worlds the future potentially holds. Those are words I wrote 10 years ago. I still believe them, but I am more concerned about how I answered the questions I posed then. In those days, I was a more passionate follower uh, and advocate of scenario planning. Uh, 
that I have since become, or at least the sort of scenario planning that I most often encounter. The origin of systematic scenario planning probably can be found in the late 1940s, when Herman Kahn, who was then a young defense analyst at RAND, started telling brief, short stories to describe the many possible ways that nuclear weapons technology might be used in conflict. This is the time when Scientific American referred to him as thinking the unthinkable. In Santa Monica, Mr. Kahn cultivated social friendships with screenwriters and film directors. One of them, Stanley Kubrick, used him as a model for Dr. Strangelove. And another, Leo Rostin, suggested the name scenarios for these very brief storytelling exercises. Kahn was an imaginative and fertile creator of these stories. He even used mainframe computers to generate new scenarios. But the consequence of this enormous abundance was that scenario planning probably would have died of its sheer complexity had it not been for a meeting at RAD with a man from Shell, a rather peculiar, uh, idiosyncratic uh, mystic named uh, Pierre Vach. I had the feeling, said uh, Vach, who was the original leader of the Royal Dutch Shell scenario team, I had the feeling of hunting in a pack of wolves, being the eyes of the pack, and sending signals back to the rest. Now, if you see something serious and the pack doesn't notice it, you'd better find out, are you really in front? Which is the point that's been addressed uh, thus far. That observation has been described as the most succinct description there is of the practice of scenario planning. Scenario planning, the use of alternative stories about the future, many with improbable and dramatic twists to develop strategy, is one of the few management innovations that originated in a think tank before going into the corporate world and then to governments. By the time Pierre Vach left Shell, he had concluded that scenario planning was not nearly effective enough to change, as he put it, the mental maps of the managers. By the time I went to work at Shell, Pierre Vach was regarded as, um, as a kind of elusive, uh, charismatic, but fraught uh, figure whose uh, life at the corporation had ended in uh, disappointment. Creating scenarios is a superficially simple but deceptively difficult discipline, as Bob Hutchings uh, could certainly tell us. The idea is straightforward enough to create pictures of possible futures. It's safer than trying to forecast because forecasts are almost always wrong. And looking out at this group, I think an, there are enough people here who would have seen the Peanuts cartoons that I grew up with. If you remember them, many of them were set in a schoolroom. And the schoolroom was sort of an archaic setting where each child had a desk in front of him and a little chair. The teacher was a voice off stage. And in one of my favorite series, the voice off stage addresses one of the children who comes down from his seat and looks forward to where the teacher must be. She says, because they were all she's when I was uh, a boy in school here in Austin. What year did Columbus discover America? And the boy says, 1954. The teacher says, how many states are there in the United States? The little boy says, 14. And this goes on for a couple more embarrassing answers. In the last panel, the little boy says, actually, I'm better on questions that are more a matter of opinion. And this has pushed us towards scenario planning and away from predictions that can be so embarrassing. Most business writers today explain scenario planning as an effort to map uncertainty. But Pierre Vach saw it as an exercise in isolating certainties, or as he called them, predetermined elements. In fact, his perspective is really quite different from that of many scenario planners, including the ones who followed him at show. The root of the difference lies in beliefs about time and about the future. The conventional view, the view that I've always held being a rather conventional person, is that the future is unknown, that it is unknowable, that it is intrinsically so, that the future is a place that no one has ever visited, and that as we advance toward it, it eludes us and recedes into the horizon. It cannot be researched because it doesn't exist yet. 
And it, we have no access to it because as we uh, approach it, as I said, it, it vanishes. The future is fundamentally indeterminate because we haven't decided on it yet. Conventional scenario making responds to this point of view by assessing the range of things that could possibly happen and depicting them as a set of possibilities. Different descriptions of how different the future might be. This is reasonable, sounds commonsensical. I think it's even effective up to a point, but it certainly has its weaknesses. And one of them is that in principle, almost anything could happen in the future. How do you compare incommensurables in the present? Another weakness is that trying to decide strategy against multiple possible conditions leads either to hedging or simply ignoring the uh, most powerful threats and initiatives. In fact, to mount the most powerful initiative, you need something more than multiple possibilities. You need to believe something about the future. And that's what scenarios cannot give you. The usual approach to building scenarios is to research the existing strategic environment, which is seen as inherently uncertain, and identify what is most uncertain and most important to you. Then you try to figure out how these uncertainties could develop in the future, and by putting these possible outcomes together, you develop a series or a matrix of scenarios. But Pierre Vaux's approach was different. He was looking for things that are already existing, things that constrain and determine these multiple possibilities in the most important ways. This is what Vaux looked for. This is what he valued when he was creating scenarios. And he called these predetermined elements because they are aspects of the future that do not change. The most important reason to develop techniques of scenario planning, however, has to do not simply with intelligence and preventing surprises. In our era, in the era of the young people who are my students, in this era, it will be the changing nature of statecraft that will call upon our anxieties about the future and the difficulty of persuading the public about preclusive politics. As Tony Blair uh, put it, many challenges today require a preemptive, a preclusive, and not simply a reactive response. A few decades back, he said, countries could wait, assess over time, even opt out, at least until things were clear. We could act when we knew. Now we have to act in advance of knowing. This means we have to act, not react. We have to do so on the basis of prediction. I've been, as I say, a, a, an advocate of scenario planning, even before I went to work for Shell to do it. But now I'm less certain, because I'm not sure that a, an array of incommensurables can give us the conviction that leaders need to persuade the public about the choices they've made when the choices they've made have destroyed alternative futures. And that brings me to my last topic, which is the, uh, the, the complicated uh, and threatening idea of Parmenides' fallacy. This fallacy rests on the idea that change is inevitable, that nothing stays the same. It is a fallacy everyone in this room commits daily, perhaps hourly, I certainly do, and one that it is hard to defend ourselves against. Let me give you an example, and if that doesn't work, then in the Q&A, maybe I can give you some others. In the 1980 presidential debate, President Carter went in uh, leading considerably uh, his challenger, Governor Reagan. Most people think that that debate determined the outcome of the election. Certainly afterwards, the numbers began to radically change. In fact, most analysts pinpoint a moment in the debate. It was the time when Governor Reagan turned away from the president, away from the moderator, and faced the cameras and said, I just want to ask the American people one thing. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Some of you may even remember that moment. It's so powerful that every challenger in every first debate now uses it against every incumbent. But it was stunningly powerful that we had double-digit inflation, we had double-digit 
interest rates, we had double-digit unemployment, our hostages were being held in Tehran. Of course we weren't better off than we were four years ago. I was working in the White House with President Carter. Even I knew that. But if you think about it for a minute, that isn't quite the right question to ask because nothing stays the same. You can't compare a present moment against the past. For if the future isn't quite here yet, the past is irrevocably gone and you can't get it back as much as we in the South would like to. <laughs> the question should have been, are you better off now than you would be now if Gerald Ford had had to cope with double-digit inflation, oil price shocks, a revolution in Iran, and so on. Now, why do we do this? Why do we take a political decision or a policy and measure it against a past that can't come back? I think the reason we do it is because measuring it against another future is just too hard. We just don't know what would have happened. And so we fall back on what we do know with confidence, which is where we were, even though we all know we can't get back to that. The problem with scenario planning is that unless it's done in Pierre Vox way, unless you can isolate those determinant factors that persist across futures, you will never be able to convince the public that the policy you took preemptively, proactively, preclusively was the right one because the public will inevitably compare it to a world before you took that action. As a result, we're like the, the drunk looking for his keys. I know many people, maybe all of you know this little joke, you come out of a bar and you see a man on the ground looking for something. He appears to be a little uh, unstable. And you go over to him and you say, are you all right? Can I help you? He says, yes, yeah, I, I, I'm just looking for my keys, for my car keys. And so you get down on the pavement and you're looking for them too. And you say, where were they when you last saw them? He said, oh, but they were over there by the car. And you say, why in the world are you looking here? He says, the light is so much better here. We can't help ourselves from doing that, and, and maybe we shouldn't even try. But try we must, because the confidence that is so quickly eroding with respect to government can't be helped by simply saying that we have realized one of a number of possibilities. I've enjoyed coming back uh, here today. Uh, I see some of my students here, and of course that's always a great pleasure for me. And so I'd like to give you something uh, back for the coffee mug I got in there. <laughs> I want to give you a very short poem by uh, Kavafi. I hope you'll see its relevance. It's called, But Wise Men Perceive Approaching Things. Men know what is happening now. The gods know the things of the future, the full and sole possessors of all light. Of future things, wise men perceive approaching things. Their hearing is sometimes, during serious studies, disturbed. The mystical clamor of approaching events reaches them, and they heed it with reverence, while outside, on the street, the people hear nothing at all. Thank you. So we are running a little bit late. Um, I think this, this mic works. Um, I will give Amy an opportunity to say just a brief remark if she, she would like to, and then we'll have time for maybe a question or two. I'm uh, looking forward to that as well. So Amy? Thanks. I like to be concise, but there's two issues that were raised by panelists that I wanted to address. Number one is how close intelligence analysts should be to policymakers, and number two is strategic versus tactical intelligence analysis. So in question number one, I think it's pretty simple. We have to be close enough to know the discussions policymakers are having, to understand the questions they're asking, so we can drive our analysis accordingly, 
but we should not be so close that if they tell us they disagree with us, that we just, in a knee-jerk fashion, change our analysis. It's important when we're challenged by policymakers to take it seriously, to think if there's something that we're missing, to ask ourselves different questions, but if in the end we conclude the same, it really is our job to speak truth to power. I'm happy to talk more about this um, in the discussion section session. I was a briefer of the President's daily brief in the Bush administration in the lead up to the Iraq war at the Pentagon, and I have a lot of um, stories that I could tell. And then the second is strategic versus tactical analysis. I just want to make a comment on the National Intelligence Council itself. I've had my job for a little over two years, and my major focus has been reorient reorienting the NIC to do strategic over the horizon analysis. I don't think it's done very many other places. I think it's important that we kind of go back to our bread and butter. Nonetheless, as I just said, we do have to be involved with policymakers. We have to use that to inform what we write. Thanks very much. I think we have, we can take five minutes, five minutes only. So if you have a question, please raise it and try to make it succinct so we can try to squeeze in two questions. Yes, sir. the recruitment of Mandarin students, um, those that go across, is it the same across all languages and specialities, or is it just Chinese students, that can't, people that go to study Chinese that come back and can't find Mandarin, or is there similar problems with, say, first-generation Muslim Americans where they can't get a security clearance? First of all, data on this is very difficult to get because obviously these are individual cases, very personalized, and security can always come back and say, well, it's because of this, that, or the other thing. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer your question. I don't know. Um, I know on the East Asian side because I spend a tremendous amount of my life helping students on East Asia get jobs and get jobs in the federal government and elsewhere. Uh, you'd need to speak to people much more familiar with the Arab world and, and other parts of the world where the CI concerns are extremely high. But I, I just am not in a position to answer that question, and I wouldn't want to cast aspersions when I you know, really don't have the data. One final question, yes sir. During the heyday of Andy Marshall, uh, certainly did uh, over the horizon analysis. Uh, I participated in several war games in the late 80s, uh, early 90s. 1992, Mr. Marshall said, I want you all as a thought experiment over the next 20 to 25 years, think about uh, a war for national survival between the United States and China, direct uh, from uh, Yoda's, uh, Yoda's mouth. And I've, I've heard a couple of you say, well, that we really aren't doing uh, strategic analysis. I know that since uh, Mr. Marshall died, I think three or four day, uh, days ago, I, I read that in the paper. Uh, everybody's nodding. I guess it's uh, occurred. And I know that the net assessments changed after, after he left. Is, but those skills were there. And they also used uh, sometimes, yeah, Alternative futures, not just uh, not just a scenario bet betting against the past. So, uh, is is that something that should be revived? Well, by well, first of all, the Office of Nested Assessment is very much in existence. Yeah. So oh, that I know it's in business. I'm talking about what uh, you know, I, I saw. I, I think what people have alluded to, to some extent, um, here on this stage, is the idea that there are so many crises going on simultaneously in the world. We live in the 24-hour news cycle that, as a result of that, you do have significant parts of the intelligence community, I think, focusing in more of a tactical and operationally analytic way, which I think is more than appropriate. Nonetheless, there are still places where strategic analysis and then net assessments are done, primarily in the National Intelligence Council. And the Office of Net Assessments at the Pentagon is up and running at full speed. I, I partner with them on a daily basis. I think the perennial problem, though, is how to preserve the expertise to do strategic analysis 
and keep developing a cadre of officers throughout the intelligence community who have the skills to do it. But others might have comments. Look, I think we need to sort of close the, the panel, bring it to a conclusion. Let me offer one final thought, and that is that policymakers understandably want intelligence to support their policies. Fair enough. But whether they know it or not, they also need intelligence to be a somewhat detached check on their ambitions, which are sometimes extravagant. They need a, a NIC, they need other institutions that are prepared to tell truth to power. And in that context, I'd like to give a shout out to the intelligence community, which in its threat briefing of January 29th, told truth to power about Iran's compliance with the nuclear deal, about their judgment that Kim Jong-un would not give up his nuclear program no matter what, by their silence that there was no urgent emergency threat on the southern border of the United States, they could easily have waffled with those answers and given more cautious judgments. They told truth to power, and the Nick, which wrote much of that uh, testimony, deserves great credit. So thank you, and please keep up the good work. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.